I'm going to show you how to solve a game tree using backwards induction. And this is basically just a way of setting up a sequential moves game where one player moves, the other observes their move, and then makes their own move, etc, etc. And this sort of format, the game tree format, is also referred to as extensive form. Now, first of all, I just want to set up this particular game. We have three players in this game, Jenny, Voldemort, and Harry. And Jenny is deciding, should I run or should I hide? Voldemort is observing what she does and deciding, should I bring my pet snake along with me or not bring my pet snake? And then Harry is observing what both of them did. And then at that point, he's deciding, do I bring my cloak or do I not bring my cloak? That's the game. And of course, we can number our players from left to right, just like we always do, player one, player two, player three. And that allows us to interpret the final payoffs as player one's payoff, player two's payoff, and player three's payoff, where I've color coded this, but usually you're not going to get the nice color coding. So let's get started. All right, there's actually one thing I want to do before I start, and I'm doing this just to make some points. So if Jenny is looking forward into this game and she's looking at all of her payoffs, she's going to see this 25 payoff down here and say, oh, I would love to get to that 25 payoff. And same thing, Voldemort is gonna look um, through this and he's going to say, uh, looking at my payoffs, I really want to get this 25 payoff. And Harry, of course, will do the same thing. Now, the point I'm making about this is that these players actually have no control over getting to the payoffs they want. And you'll understand that in a second. So what's the process? Process of backwards induction is to start at the end of the game where we, we're going to solve every last node first. So this is the last node since there's no other decisions after it. And we're going to look at this node and ask ourselves, if Harry finds himself at this node, what decision will he make? And we can see that if he brings the cloak, he gets a payoff of negative five. If he doesn't bring the cloak, he gets a payoff of 12. He prefers the 12. So if we get to this node, we know we will never reach this, this outcome. So we can actually cross it out. So, well actually, Jenny and Voldemort also don't like that, but we know even if they love that, even if Jenny had a payoff of 100 up here, she would never be able to reach that node because we know if Harry gets to this node, he is not going to bring his cloak. And that's the key logic here. So we'll solve every single end node, which in this case is all Harry's. If Harry ends up here, He's going to look at the negative 10, his payoff if he chooses cloak, and he'll look at the eight, his payoff if he doesn't bring his cloak. He prefers the payoff of eight, so he crosses, so, so everybody is going to cross out that end node as being something that will never be reached. And then we do the same thing for his other two nodes. All right, now we have four end nodes left in the game and we can move one step backwards. So we're going to move to Voldemort's decision and Voldemort is going to say, if I choose to bring my snake, then we're going to end up here for sure. My payoff is negative 15. If I choose not to bring my snake, we know we're going to end up down here and my payoff is negative nine. He prefers the negative nine more than in the negative 15. So he will choose not to bring his snake if he ends up at this node, meaning this node will never be reached regardless of how much Jenny likes that payoff of 15. And then we do the same thing down here. If Voldemort brings his snake, he knows he'll get a payoff of 18, because we're going to end up here. If he doesn't bring his snake, he knows we're going to end up down here with a payoff of negative five. So if Voldemort finds himself at this node, he will choose to bring his snake, meaning this end node will never be reached. Even though this was actually Jenny's favorite end node. She knows if she uses backwards induction, that even if she chooses hide, there's never going to be a situation where 
Voldemort will choose not to bring his snake. Voldemort will bring his snake in response to her hide down here. So now we're left with two possible end nodes and we move back one step to the beginning of the game to Ginny's choice and she's deciding, do I run or do I hide? And if she runs, she knows for sure, based on Voldemort's decision and Harry's decision, if they're using backwards induction, that we'll end up over here and she'll get a payoff of 10. If she chooses to hide, then she knows exactly how things are going to play out. She knows Voldemort will choose to bring his snake, Harry will choose to bring his cloak, and her payoff will be negative five in that case. So she likes the 10 better than the negative five, so she's not going to choose to hide. And therefore, the solution to this game is for Ginny to run, Voldemort to not bring his snake, and for Harry to not bring his cloak. And this will be the final payoffs for the three players in that game. Let's do one more example. All right, this is going to be an example of capture the flag where there are two players left and you're trying to decide uh, what to do, what, what your move right now should be, given that the other player is going to observe your move and respond. So the three options are you play defense, you just sort of hold your fort and sort of uh, try to follow them to stop them from coming in, you guard your flag, or you play offense. And the other player has the same three options. So of course we're going to solve this using backwards induction by identifying the nodes at the very end of the game that lead to the payoffs and seeing what will the player do in each of these cases. So if player two is sitting here, player looks at the possible options and the payoffs here are going to be zero, 10, and zero. So if you choose defense, then player two will definitely choose offense. So we will never reach these. And um, once again, if you guard, if you as player one guard, um, we know using backwards induction that player two will look at these three options and between the zero, the nine, and the zero, player two is going to choose offense. And so we will never reach these two situations. If you choose to guard, the other player will uh, choose offense. And then at this one, we can look at the payoffs and notice that player two is choosing between the one, the five, and the two. Player two chooses the five, that's offense, and therefore we will never reach these. So we actually notice that offense is a dominant strategy for the other player. Now you have to decide your best strategy. So if you choose defense, you get negative eight. If you guard, your expected value is negative four. If you choose offense, your expected value is five. So um, the best of those three is of course the five. And what's going to happen is both players will play offense. Now, the actual payoffs at the end here are going to depend on which of these last two players is a better runner, which of the last two players is better at sort of sneaking up on the other and running around them. Um, like the payoffs are determined by the actual skill set of the two people involved and maybe also the terrain or something like that. But in any case, that's backwards induction. That's two examples of how you use backwards induction to solve a game tree. It's an excellent tool for sequential moves games in game theory.